Hello, everyone. I would like to give a warm welcome to Robin Schlund. Welcome to the show, Robin. Thank you. Robin is an experienced couples therapist. She's completed levels one, two, and three of the Gottman Method Training for Couples. She's a trained leader for the Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work workshop. She is the practice owner and therapist at Integrity Counseling and Wellness, LLC, where she's worked predominantly with couples since 2020. She's a licensed professional counselor and certified substance abuse counselor with 20 years of experience in the fields of mental health and substance abuse. Lastly, she's pursuing her doctoral degree, PhD, in industrial organizational psychology. What we do have in common is our couple counseling work. Um, and the main reason why I'm excited to talk with you is that you have a wealth of experience in research into what makes successful relationships work. Uh, what would you like to share with our audience about your passion for research and your findings? So thank you for having me. I'd like to start by saying that. And so I'll just basically kind of give a little bit of a background, just starting into in private practice and a group practice. I wanted to work with couples and I did. I began working with couples and I just did not have the skill set at that time. Mm in order to be able to fully help couples. Mm. So what I determined, and I was at my mentor said, you should really check out the Gottmans at the Gottman Institute. John Gottman has done a significant amount of research, many decades actually in research on couples. And mm. so I dove right in. And when I did, I, I immersed myself in his literature and his research and understanding the sound relationship house theory what makes couples masters of relationship and disasters, what can predict divorce and all of those things. And so that basically set the stage for me to really be able to work mm -hmm. and help with couples. And in addition, the more experience that I had working with couples, then I started to see the trends and what things were happening within couples relationship and uh, heterosexual relationships. I work, I work with same-sex couples. And so I, I just learned a lot and been able to put those things. And the research even covers those topics. The John Gottman's research cover, co uh, covers same-sex as well as heterosexual relationships. And it's, so it really equipped me with all the information that I could possibly need to be able to really work with couples. And then basically down the road, I, I did start to get into my, my PhD studies and was very interested with industrial organizational psychology, kind of uh, the workplace. And, and so it basically kind of organically occurred when I started to look at personality and understanding personality and the latest mm. research of personality. And then I combined the personality and understanding of all the data of the relevant data for personality and put that together with my background with the Gottman's and understanding the Gottman method. And it's just, it's just a powerful, a powerful uh, coming together of research and information that has been very, uh, it's been profound with my couples. It's made such a such a big difference mm. because they had the behavioral piece. But in addition to that, when you understand your own temperament, your partner's temperament, things that are individual differences and what makes up a, a person, gender differences, all of those things, it can really help to make the, a master of relationships. And that's basically what John Gottman calls those. Right, that, that there, are, there are so many findings uh, so maybe we can zoom in, in on some of them. Uh, what stands out? What are the trends in today's society? Uh, maybe it's easier if we say let's discuss heterosexual couples to start with, and maybe you can say, well, this could be similar, I suppose, for 
other couples. Uh, what, what do you see happening today? So what I found too with the, with the, I would say the heterosexual couples I work with, it's very interesting. It's, it, it, I think things have changed and I don't, I don't really think that you can take one particular situation where it kind of can depend on the individual at couple that I work with that uh, the gentleman is a very traditional man uh, and certainly wants to provide. And, uh, and so in that regard, he does that and, and he's very good at that. And so I think that, but that can be very different in other relationships. I've worked with couples that where they're, where there's very much and a work toward egalitarian and, and division of chores and things of that nature. And even in my, what I found in my own marriage and working that basically it's a give and take. And I have found that. And when I think about, when I think about the basis of behavior, just in general, and all that I've learned from the relevant research from the Gottmans and what's required mm -hmm. and basically going into what can help, what can be, it's good in the beginning and what makes a relationship work is is when you think about the foundation so say if i have a couple that comes to me and they they will explain some of their issues and they'll say this is happening or this is happening yeah. so i kind of take a, a two-pronged approach i mm. i provide them the the foundation when you think what makes marriages work or basically it's it's easier kind of predict to predict what causes relationship demise. And one of the things that I observe, I'll have them discuss a conflict issue for may, say maybe 10, 15 minutes. And within that, I can see if there are one of the predictors of divorce. And one of those is, it's called the full horseman of the apocalypse. And it's criticism. That's the first one. And I can see that in those dynamics. Defensiveness, I can, and I can see that in those discussions. Uh, contempt is very, that's not, that's basically sulfuric acid on a relationship. And the last one is stonewalling. So you don't necessarily see stonewalling within a 10 to 15 minute conflict discussion. But that's one of the biggest predictors of divorce or relationship demise. So what I can do in those instances is I can give them the tools of, or the antidotes. Those are, an, there are antidotes for those four horsemen. And so they had that. And then we take it a step further and folks that I've worked with for years, I will have them take a very detailed personality assessment, which covers their personality overall, such as their uh, agreeableness, their conscientiousness, their extroversion, neuroticism, which is known as negative emotion, as well as their openness to experience. And so how those things all come together they're like, wow, not only can I understand myself, I can understand my partner and then also put these other amazing things in practice, such as turning towards your partner. If your partner makes a bid for a connection, I'm sure you've heard that in your, in your own mm -hmm. uh, making a bid for a connection and reciprocating that bid and turning towards and what makes relationships last over time. And so that is... All, all those things come together quite well. So you talked about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Of the yeah. apocalypse. Yeah. And the criticism and defensiveness go hand in hand because normally we feel defensive when we feel criticized. Um, and contempt uh, to me seems to be related to um, resentment. So I suppose it's also at what stage into unhappiness, for the lack of a better word, did that couple approach us? Uh, because whatever is the reason, whether one person has, bottling, has been bottling things up and build some resentment, then they come to us and that contempt uh, and that impulse to criticize is is very strong because one feels taken for granted. I've been uh, sort of putting up or uh, been kind. Or you've been taking advantage. You've uh, you've not listened to my needs or uh, or met them. 
Um, so you call them predictors. Um, they're not necessarily there from the start, right? It could be that uh, by the time they come and see you, there are a lot of uh, red flags uh, that, that tell you they might be divorcing soon. I suppose what I'm asking is, um, could some of these couples be saved had they come yes. and see you earlier on? What's what I found interesting. I have I have a couple that were that have been married for that have been married for twenty five plus years. They came to me at a position where there was substance use disorder. There were two affairs, and so that is. I mean, when you're there, you're talking lack of trust, which then can in turn can make someone very critical because they're very resentful. And then in turn, it can it can turn into a, a contemptuous situation. Even hostile humor can be contempt. Mm -hmm. And so what I found with, with this particular couple, what I have couples do in addition, because again, I love the research. I love where I can say it's the Gottman relationship checkup. I had them take that. And I can see where they fall in their sound relationship house. And I can really know because there's red flags within that Gottman relationship checkup where I know this, re this relationship is on life support. And I can really tell that. And so what I found with this particular couple, I would say their friendship was, the, was such a big basis which is so important. There must be fondness, fondness, a fondness for one another, as well as respect and admiration. Now you're not going to have a ton of respect when there's been affairs, right? You're just not going to have that. It's going to be very difficult to overcome, but there was a strong basis of friendship that had occurred over the, over time, the couple lived apart. I don't want to give too many details, obviously for confidentiality purposes, but you know, lived apart. Uh, we process those things. There's protocols that are that are specifically for affairs with the Gottman method. And so we work through a, a lot a lot of those things. And uh, that couple, they have since bought a home together. The family's reunited along with with uh, children and things of that nature. So it's never too late. However, I do know there's a, there's a high percentage of couples that have already thought about divorce by the time they see me. So I certainly can't take it. I, de I definitely can't take it personal if they don't make it. I've also had couples that prior to understanding personality the way that I do today, if I could have really helped them and added that personality piece, there may have been some things that we could do, but all in all, when it comes to when it when it came to that relationship, they didn't make it, and that's okay too. That is okay too, really. And and I, like again, I can't take that personally. So I do I do think that I try to say I can't promise you anything, but I don't want you to give up hope, and I want you to know that I can provide you all the necessary tools that I have learned through the relevant research to help make you guys a successful couple and what does work and what doesn't work. And they have, I have had couples who put that into play and do very, very well. And couples that, that have a harder time, maybe they need some individual work done due to things that uh, cause maybe more trigger, triggering to that individual. And I found too, mm. trauma plays a big part. So individual work is also equally important to, for, in, you know, for folks in order to, to be able to come together, because if you find yourself uh, constantly reacting, which, which can happen if there's criticism, someone who's really emotionally well that I, what I have found in my work, someone who's an emotionally well person can typically take levels of criticism and not respond defensively. Now that requires someone that is extremely emotionally well. And they mm -hmm. can say the antidote to defensiveness is accepting responsibility. And they can say, you know what? I'll take a look at that. 
And so now do they do more of the emotional heavy lifting in the dynamic? They do. And I, and I oftentimes tell couples that you will more than likely do more of the emotional lifting in this dynamic until they are able to, to work through these things that may cause them to react versus respond where they are defensive and they feel criticized. And so, and there's also interventions that can be done that I've worked that uh, I've worked with lots of couples and, and put these interventions into play and yes. they work off. Well, there's a lot in, in there. It's very rich what you're saying, but uh, I one one thing that does come up for me is uh, how important that acknowledgement of you're going to be doing more heavy lifting, uh, um, because that um, expecting that the other half is like us. It's it's a common expectations, but. Uh, it's really unhelpful. Um, it, it, it won't be completely equal. Um, so if you stop comparing uh, their behavior, his behavior, her behavior, to what you would be doing in that situation, it, it's really helpful. And it's even more helpful if you accept that you're going to work harder until that person has had their own self-growth through therapy or other means. Um, is rare and uh, it's definitely as therapists to put that across it won't be equal i i appreciate that you are doing more of the work now and it's needed um so long as the other person doesn't take advantage <laughs> and um, so well therapy is offering that space where the um, control dynamic and who's being more dominant and who's being uh, assertive and who's being unassertive. And so if I'm doing more of the work, let's acknowledge that. Let's appreciate that. Appreciation. So important. It is. And I have found that. And I'm not, I, I do try to, to tell them what they need to hear versus what they want to hear. And because it's the truth, I don't, I'm not going to do couples any, a, 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 I'm going to do them a disservice by saying, oh, it just should be equal all the time and things, it, because it's just not that way. Life, work, children, all of those things come into play. And, and that is what's so important about fondness and admiration and friendship and cultivating a, a, a res, a appreciation in the relationship so you can guard against when those things are tough. And even when your partner, that you can understand them and understand their inner world so you can kind of know, you know, he's got a really tough uh, job that he's working on and this right now. And so uh, this, is, this, this requires me to be maybe a little bit more understanding in this situation and it's a give and take and that is what i know within my own relationship and marriage and what i see with others it's very very different and and you have some individuals who are at home versus at work you have you, most over over what 51 percent of women and i know in the united states over half the women are in the workforce so you have two individuals with very uh, important jobs and uh, and you you just really have to be in tune with your partner on on an internal level uh, build that fondness and admiration system build that cultivate appreciation and respect so you can guard against when things get tough when everything is about the children if a child is in crisis and things of that nature that allows you to kind of ward off and and that's what's so helpful but in addition to that, if you do understand, say, when I think about, and I've learned, I learned this, this was so important in my own life to understand my own personality and understand that I'm a person that's high in agreeableness, which means I'm high in compassion and I'm not as high in politeness, but I'm extremely high. I'm on, I'm an outlier in agreeable, in agreeableness. And so people are that are agreeable and women are more agreeable than men. They mm. tend to do more. You'll do more in the dynamic because you, it's basically the mother gene. When you think about agreeableness and compassion and 
and when when you do more and and you're not and you're holding on to the resentment that's where the criticism can come in as well and then it can turn into contempt so it's up to me it's very important because i know i'm so agreeable in order to negotiate on my own behalf it's very important i've had to learn that with my with my husband with my children because i will do all the things and then have some resentment feeling feeling taken for granted and 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 then it it turns into a bigger situation so it's very important that throughout and i explain this to couples say what needs to be said if you've got a complaint don't let it go on for so long because because then it then then the absolutes come in you never you always and that's just a very dangerous area for couples in general and if i hear it i stop them immediately we're not going to do absolutes we're just not you cannot it's not helpful and it won't help things get any better so you we we have touching on the issues of roles different roles and uh, you know complete equality is not possible um so mutual trust is very important whichever roles the couple are, are, are happy to agree on uh, mm -hmm. trouble is that very often they the things roles are not discussed uh before uh committing uh, into the long term relationship um are you more of an optimist when it comes to today's western society uh, given that these roles are really up for being negotiated. And often, I mean, these days, differences can be so huge comparing to the past where the role of men and women was much more defined. And if you looked at your peers, in your community or at your church and uh, in your town, there was a lot of similarities and consistency across society. So that helped people also accept whatever role they were having because most of their peers were having a very, very similar dynamics at home. So are you more of an optimist that we can, uh, uh, the men and women, uh, can, uh, can agree <laughs> on what yes. those roles are? And what would uh, it look think, like to agree? I, I think that I think that's why the foundation is so important. And I do think that and and, obvi and obviously I'm a little bit biased as a couples therapist and I have a little bit of an advantage and just fully immersed in the research. So within my own relationship, I know what works and what doesn't. And I, I am oh, I'm just so unbelievably optimistic. I do think, I don't think that there has to be clearly defined roles. I think we can all have it come together, that we can all work together in, in, in our dynamic. It's not like there's a requirement for me to do laundry or for him to do laundry. It's, uh, it's we, we try to work towards sharing that. In addition to, we do have established, and we do have it established in a way that basically throughout the week, um, other than I, I take care of dinner on four nights through the week, which is Monday, you know, the work week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And he is, he takes care of dinner Wednesday right. night. And in but, his, and well, I just want to say this really quickly. And he does the dishes every single morning. And so that is what we have agreed and worked out. And I am optimistic for other couples that you can find similar a similar and level level the playing field for your relationship and don't compare yours to other folks. Great. How do you keep giving the, each other the benefit of the doubt? Uh, because you are blessed. Uh, uh, you are describing your marriage where you're giving each other the benefit of the doubt. You're working as a team. Um, you're taking risks, and you, but you feel spontaneous. I mean, you uh, because you know that your partner trusts you. Uh, you were saying earlier on in the discussion that infidelity is the one thing that crushes, obviously, trust and uh, to to regain uh, any respect. Whether that's possible at all, it takes months and years. So, providing that things like infidelity don't happen. 
Um, but there is also individual baggage. And yeah, so I, I would I would assume that you also had a history of good of working on yourself. The country, not just the research, the, you know, obviously the wealth of res Gotham and research as well. So um, I feel that giving each other the benefit of the doubt is an essential component to accept each other's roles and not to ever feel like he's taking advantage. Oh, is she, is she, am I doing more than she's doing? Well, I, I do think that that can occur. And I think that it, and that's the thing that goes back to that personality piece for me of being an agreeable person. I will tend to do more as more of, when I say motherly or compassionate, I will tend agreeable people do do more. And I found that. And I think I mean, you, you said it perfectly when you think about trust is the foundation. It's essential. It's absolutely essential. However, I have a particular couple that have had survived and they are thriving together, even with those two and have rebuilt trust on a variety of levels. But the foundation beyond a shadow of a doubt is the is that uh, cultivation, appreciating each other. Look for the good things. When I look for the good things that my partner does. Uh, and anything. And even when, even there's a, even though the role is kind of defined about the dishes, I will still say, thank you so much for taking care of the dishes. Thank you so much. And so that appreciation can build a solid foundation to work toward giving each other the benefit of the doubt when you want a long lasting dynamic. And right. so that along with understanding, really communicating with each other, having um, having an and ensuring the departure in the morning has has is uh, a, a um, just that has a, is a thing that your reunion in the evening is a thing whether it be physical touch is a thing these things are so important to help you feel connected because when emotional distance sets in because you don't have that foundation. The benefit of the doubt, you you got it, you hit it from the nail on the head. Benefit of the doubt goes out the window, and you start seeing. You don't just scan. You 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 can't scan the environment for positive things. And even when and and on each side, if you're if you're in more of a negative sentiment override, which is not that five to one ratio, and things start happening. Even something that your partner may do that's neutral, you see yeah. it as negative. And so yeah. there's and so and so it's just that foundation. And that is where good individual therapy, but good couples therapy comes in also to say you've got to really take these tools and put them into play, cultivate a, um, cultivate appreciation, work on your friendship. You know, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry you have young children. Work toward, figure it out. Get a babysitter. Go out. If you can't do it every week, do it every other week. Make sure your reunions look a certain way. They don't have to look the same for everyone. And your departures look uh, a certain way when you leave. It's like when you it, just imagine how mm. difficult it is for any couple where you just where one just leaves and doesn't say a word to their partner. That that's that that will lend itself to emotional disengagement, which is not good. So when the time comes to really, really need to give the benefit of the doubt, and where you really need to be able to help to to fend off when things aren't equal, when the chores aren't looking like it's looking like, man, I'm doing way more laundry than him, or way you know, or whatever that might look like. Uh, and so if you have that foundation. You can really guard against uh, the the over the long term in a relationship. That that's what's needed. But what's equally important too, and I found in a variety of ways, it's not necessarily what you do because we all mess up. It's what you do after, and that's where repair comes in. And for long lasting relationships, repair must be a part of it. And you can say, like, if you're if, if you're if you have a situation where you are. Um, sensitive and you kind of 
spark, you know, for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, to that partner, you can come back and say, look, I'm really sorry. Like, I'm just having a tough go of it. And so because of that foundation that you've worked so hard to build and put, build that, those tools uh, in the, in the relationship, they can mm -hmm. say, you know what, it's, it's okay. It's really okay. And you can work, but you must have, and that's the part two, you must have the difficult discussions and say what needs to be said, because even through conflict, because conflict exists, it's not resolved, it's managed. And when you can do that, you can effectively do those things. You come out better and stronger and, and you can move in a solid direction uh, to have a really, a really solid relationship. Thanks, Robin. It's very inspiring. Um, in terms of a uh, support network, I, I am based uh, in London, UK, uh, and most of my clients, most of the couples I work with, uh, hardly know oh, their neighbors, uh, um, let alone they are friends with them and uh, not near their families. Um, so is are these nuclear families uh, contributing to the issue of expecting so much from your partner, the fact that you only have one person to fulfill your needs? I think that that's, that's so important to, to touch on because I do think just individuals, as individuals, we must have community, whatever that looks like. It doesn't community is important of course your intimate relations uh, your, your intimate relationship is important of course some of us a lot of us have issues with family whatever that can look like in the healthiest way for you as a person whatever that can look like a couple of friends you don't need a ton of friends you don't necessarily have to know all of your neighbors i mean it's nice and you know i think it's just not absolutely necessary but friends are necessary I think friends are necessary, people you can talk to, people that you can trust. There are people that I can trust that within my life, even just a small few that I take information to, to help me process things. So I don't inundate my partner with all the stuff at work. And sometimes I, you know, if you find that, that's the thing. It's important for me to try to have some solid friendships with people that I trust that will hold on to the information that I provide them, allow me to vent, give me advice if I ask for it or when I need it and things of that nature and some level of community as well. And family can, you know, my, I'm, I have, I have two brothers and my mother's still fortunately uh, around. And I, I love mm. just was with her and my family on mother's day. Uh, I think that's very important. Also, I think family, intimate family is important. Uh, I, but I, I do think it, it the, that strong basis of within a household, and I'm in a blended family. I have a, um, I have five mm -hmm. children total. One is, um, one is, uh, their age range from two to 23. And, um, mm -hmm. my two year old is my, is my stepson. So we're in a blended family. So, uh, we have a very, uh, it's, it's wonderful. And so we are very busy within our family unit, very busy. And so, but certainly uh, our extended family plays a part. And so all of those things matter. I do think though community is important. I think of course your intimate relationship, friends, uh, and of course work, you want, you certainly want to have meaningful work and that's important as well. And if you can have kind of all of those things, you're in pretty good shape. You don't have to have every single one of them, but I think if you have those things that can also help to, to uh, strengthen that uh, dynamic within your home as well. Uh, community, you talked a lot about quality time, sharing quality time with your partner, uh, having friends uh, or community members where you, you can experience your partner, uh, their sense of humor, how they behave socially, rather than constantly on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and also, getting your needs met, not getting to a level of desperation. I'm desperate to, to, to have somebody that can hear my runs and, uh, or that is able to listen to, to me. You, uh, because you do have people in your community or 
family that um, are able to give to, to, to listen well. But there's another aspect as well, which is childcare. Um, so not not only is a financial issue that some families cannot afford childcare costs, but it becomes a, a major reason of resentment and disagreement. Oh, I'm doing uh, more for our baby, and and also very often feeling aggrieved that the other half is not caring for the baby. So I'm doing more. And also, you don't seem to care much. So this is this is massive. This is yeah. This is yeah. I suppose well, communities have that beauty. I mean, traditional communities also fulfilled that um, that you had people that would entertain your children. Not only that, they would stimulate your children. A lot of uh, Children's education wasn't just coming from schooling, but would also come from relatives and discussions in within the community. So uh, you talked about blended families being a potential, not replacement, but the way that I suppose in the West, one of the ways in which we can recreate communities. Um, how do people go about it? I mean, in your case, you you know, it's just circumstances. Uh, that that led you to be part of a blended family, but how can people create these communities these days? Well, I think that you have to just find interest things that are interest you interest you. I, I really do on some level, and I think there's lots of ways that 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 couples do that. Some couples that I know they're in CrossFit together, so they get to be together in that way but in addition, be with community and be with other people. That's very different. That's an excellent way of community where other folks have their church family. And so it, it just, I think it can really depend and that can mm. help and, and build to strengthen, to help. So, so you do have other individuals that can say, man, you know, you guys are great together. I, I know you have a young child, you know, let's see if we can help out and look after Look after your little one so you guys can mm -hmm. spend time together. And I do, I think it's when you talk about childcare and the expenses and those things and, and family, it can be very difficult. It can be very difficult. And actually what, I, what I've done, I've worked with uh, couples too that are pregnant and, and uh, there's a protocol with, for, uh, for the Gottmans, it's called bringing baby home. And I worked through that with a couple that was preparing for a baby. Mm. And what I found in working with the bringing baby home piece, because it's a massive change, when you think about a year after you have a baby from both individuals and what that looks like and how it changes the dynamic within the relationship, but what it comes back to and what I found doing that protocol with couples what it comes back to is the same foundation, cultivating that appreciation, keeping that friendship strong to the best of your ability, even with this little one knowing, but it is little, little toddlers and babies. That is a stressful time. It really is. And equally teenagers can be equally stressful too. So it's very interesting. So you do have to try to build to the best of your ability. And I do think sometimes it's, it's like, if you don't have family around, say they, they live in another state, my husband's family uh -huh. lives in another state and they're 10 hours away. And so, and so if you don't have that, you want to try to work to work. I feel that, you know, it's, I don't want to say responsibility, but it is our responsibility to try to, to help our situation. And if there is, if there is a situation where finances might be, uh, an issue where we can't just get a babysitter every Saturday night when we have little toddler to go out and enjoy each other. We work to build a community of people that will, will, will we can help them. They can help us. They have a toddler. We have a toddler. So we look after each other in that way when the family piece may, may not be as well as a financial piece. And so I think that's very important at the end of the day in, in my belief and certainly in my relationship, it's up to me. It's my responsibility for me to work on this relationship because this is the the most difficult yet rewarding thing I will ever do. 
is my relationship. And, and then in turn, my kid, my children can see the strength of our dynamic and what that looks like. And so they, then they can in turn, you know, willingly and hopefully have, have solid relationship relationships as they grow. So I, I do think that there is a level of responsibility on my part as well to help cultivate all of those things. Robin, uh, today we agreed to have more of a general discussion because this uh, was going to be our first podcast together. So um, I feel like we've accomplished that and uh, because all of these things do deserve us to perhaps next time zoom in and uh, uh, focus on some of them more specifically. Um, so I don't know if you have any final comments because... Uh, how can we generalize, you know, that there's, uh, there's so much diversity? Yes, there is Western couples. Yes, we can see trends. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, like you were saying, when you work with a particular couple, you, you can find something that is very specific to that particular couples. You said that... You know, even infidelity people can overcome you know if there's a strong friendship uh um even that could be overcome so uh there isn't any conclusion to draw from this chat but i look forward to the next one as as do i yes likewise thank you so much thank you so much robin <laughs>